First of all, salam alaikum to everyone uh, attending. Uh, my name is Saeed al -Gargawi. I have the Dubai Future Academy within the uh, Dubai Future Foundation. And this is the Ramadan Pioneer Series, an initiative that we've been running uh, for the past few years now. Uh, and ultimately what this is, is an opportunity to talk about how the future would look like and in particular for this year's theme is how would life look like post COVID-19, right? Uh, we all know that this is going to be a new normal with social distancing, uh, with even uh, for many different culture, the greeting uh, customs will differ as a result. So this hits right, uh, not only on a personal, but even on a cultural and societal level as a whole. If you look at all of the various plagues that have happened uh, throughout human history, they don't last for a month or two or even a week. They last for years. The latest plague in 1918 uh, lasted for two years. Uh, so as a result, a new normal uh, is, is, is created and new economies are created as well. And when we talk about new and how the future would look like, uh, I could not think of a better person than John Sanai to actually talk to us about this and to engage us in this discussion and dialogue and to allow everyone to pitch in some of their questions. Uh, you know, we know this, this uh, time period is challenging and as such, this is the platform for you to voice some of you, the questions that you may have on how do you put yourself in that future and where you would be. So, I'll, so John, as some of you uh, may know, is an author of bestsellers of What is Your Moonshot, Magnetize, and Foresight. John, as well, is the co-founder and chief exponential officer of the Future Self Academy, an online author-led platform that connects create, uh, connectors with the curious uh, thinkers of the world. So, John, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be here and a great privilege to be speaking with Future Dubai Future Academy. I'm such a big fan. So wonderful to be on this platform. Hello to all the listeners from wherever you are. If you're fasting, may it be a blessed fast. And we find ourselves in incredibly uncertain times. When I heard about COVID-19 happening, I was writing my fourth book called The Evolution of Value. And very quickly, I started to realize that the book itself had become somewhat irrelevant because I think anybody speaking about anything that's got to do with strategy or with the future needs to have a lens of this new pandemic insight. And so I stopped writing that book and I started writing three new books. In lieu of what was going on around us, I thought it necessary for us to start rethinking how we need to show up, what our consumers will want after this, and what do we need to define success like? Because ultimately, just like you said, Said, what we have seen when pandemics like this have happened in the past or major global um, crises have happened, we have seen that there have been new ways for us to show up. Now, one of the ways, hi, Kalfan. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. One of the ways that we've seen this in the past is the Black Death in Europe. In the 14th century, when we had this sort of pandemic happen, we saw the end of feudalism, which was their capitalism at the time. And that end of feudalism brought about new technologies of agriculture, new societal norms, and actually the birth of the Italian Renaissance, where we started to define success with art and culture and stories rather than just the feudalistic way of living. And so now we find ourselves in the same scenario, in the same global pandemic. And what we've gotten in, in really in a great advantage this time is science. Back then, people thought that God was punishing them. And people thought that the stars had aligned in a bad way to take people out. In fact, people were dying left, right, and center, and nobody knew why. Today, we, in two weeks' time, found a way to check for the disease and a way to communicate with everybody to be able to get locked down. So what we have is a lack of that number of deaths, but the total upturning, the total recalibration of every touch point of our society, our economics, and our lives. Think about it. As you would know, education, your kids are being now educated differently, corporations, many corporations are saying around the world that they're never sending their people back to their offices. 
The way we eat and what we eat and how we eat is now starting to change. The way we relate to each other. And as you were saying, say my shaking hands with you will be like this from now on. And this is the new reality that we're moving into. So what I did was I started writing this new future trilogy to try and help people and organizations prepare for this new world that is 100% uncertain. And we must all realize that even to this day right now, the world's best futurists cannot tell you how this is going to pan out because it's impossible to tell. Because when you have so many different touch points of society changing, how do you know which isn't going to domino which other? How do you know that the bankruptcies that are going to be going after this, how are they going to be domino affecting the way industries and the way people work and engage with each other? So it's really important that the thing that we need to focus on more than anything else is how do we prepare for the unknown? How do we prepare for uncertainty? How do we prepare for the world that we don't actually know? And the question I get consistently from organizations, people, companies, whoever out there, is this question, what will life be like post COVID-19? And I've got two answers. One, why are you wanting to run back to the world that most of us were anxious in? Why do you want to work in a world that we were running from pillar to post, trying to balance our family life, our career life, our fitness, our holidays, and everything was just mayhem. But as human beings, what we are is addicted to familiarity. It's the way we perceive comfort. And many of us find ourselves married to people that are similar to our parents. We often say, well, this marriage seems just like the parents, my parents' marriage. And the reason for that is, is that we don't look for love, we look for familiarity. That's how we perceive love to be. And in our lives, even though the life before COVID-19 was hectic, we still want it back. Even though it wasn't as great as it could be, even though it didn't allow us to spend more time with our children, or it didn't allow us to just breathe and think a little bit more, we want to run back to that familiarity. And so the first book I wrote was called Future Now. The second book I've written that just came out yesterday called Future How. Both of them are free downloads from my website. You can go and download them, johnsone.com backslash books. They're free for everybody to download. They guide books to try and get us to firstly understand the emotional state that we need to have in times of uncertainty. And secondly, what I've done, and I've partnered with a globally well-known economist to write about a new type of economy that we could start bringing about in this new world post COVID-19. But let me take you through just a couple points around future now, because I think ultimately what has happened to us is that we have all been shocked in how our futures have been canceled. Think about it. Anything that you had planned, whether you wanted to buy a pair of shoes that you've been saving up for, or if you wanted to go for a birthday party with your friends to a restaurant, or if you wanted to get married, everything has been put on hold. And all of us are sitting at home. And so now what starts to happen, a couple of things start happening. First, we have to start mourning our future memories. Now, we must remember that memories are not just things from the past. They're also the projections we have into the future. And if you've ever gone through a breakup with a boy or a girl, the thing that you miss, the, the thing that you mourn is the fact of losing the future memories that you had built together. Those are the things that are really painful. And so what we have to do first and foremost is give ourselves the gift, the time to actually mourn our future memories. They're gone. They're never coming back. And so we have to let them go. And in order to let anything go, the five stages of mourning are really important. First one, denial. That's not happening. Yeah, it's not going to be happening. It's going to be finishing real soon. Don't worry, this will be done. And that's not the truth. Then we go through bargaining and like, don't worry, it's only going to take three months, now two months, now one week, oh, we'll be out of this real soon. And then we go into anger, anger that I've lost my future income, anger that the plans I had aren't happening, anger that my holiday that I had planned to Greece wasn't happening. That's just me. But anyway, and so all of this happens in the sort of state of anger. And then we get to grief or depression and we find ourselves mourning and crying and sobbing at both our own future, plus at doctors that are losing their lives, at people that are losing their lives in hospitals without their loved ones around them. And finally, we get to acceptance. And this is really key, is because if we don't get to acceptance, we will waste this golden opportunity to reinvent, recalibrate, and rethink how we want to come out of this. 
Because if we stay waiting, stay angry, stay in denial and bargaining, we ultimately will just wait for this to pass and then not utilize it as the gift that it is. The second point I make in the book on future now is that this situation is triggering us on our own very personal survivor consciousness trigger point. In other words, you're either thinking that this is the worst thing that's happened to you, or you're thinking that it's the best thing that's happened to you. And this just shows whether you're coming at this from a victim mindset or a creator mindset. Now, the victim mindset has got three characteristics. The first one is, poor me, I can't believe this has happened to me. My life is finished. Oh God, I can't believe this has happened. Or the other corner is the person that's always being sympathetic for everybody out there. Oh, I feel so bad for them. Oh, I feel so sorry for them. Oh, I feel so bad for them. But you actually don't do anything about it. And what you're actually doing is giving yourself the permission to feel sorry for other people. But you're not helping anybody out there. And the third character is anger. Angry at this person, angry at that government, angry at the Chinese, angry, just angry. But ultimately, if you're feeling sorry for yourself, feeling sorry for other people or being angry, you're not helping anybody. And so ultimately, you want to change those and say, instead of feeling sorry for myself, how do I create? How do I tap into my genius and try and bring about a new skill set? Instead of feeling sorry for people, start empowering people. You know, Oprah is a great example. She doesn't feel sorry for women. She empowers women very different. Both are caring, but one is chewing in their own sadness and one is looking for ways to coach people out of their problems. And moving from anger to challenger. And challenger is the real energy you want to challenge yourself and the people around you to step up through this crisis. Now, I've made nine points in that book. And the last point I want to just take you through is a point that I've called burn your ships. And this point has brought some controversy, so bear with me. The concept here is in order for us to catalyze our energy, to change our business models, to move away from what we used to think success is, to redefining success, what we need to do is burn our ships from where we came from. Now, parts of your life you don't need to burn, and other parts you actually need to burn, because how do you catalyze yourself forward if you're still holding on and bargaining for this to end? Now, the burn your ship story is a famous story. Many generals arrived on land with their ships to go into battle, and they realized that there were more people or more soldiers on land than they had. So instead of backing off or um, moving away, they, what they did is they burned their ships, so the soldiers had to go on land and fight. And what they did was actually win. And that's the point here, is that if you don't take on the energy to burn your ships, to be able to catalyze yourself into this new future, into this new renaissance that's coming, you won't be part of it. You just won't be part of it. You'll just be waiting, and then you watch other businesses fly by, and there'll be new multi-billion dollar businesses, and you'll be still stuck doing what you used to do pre-COVID-19. So, future now. I suggest and urge you to read it, because what it is, it's a guidebook to try and get our emotional state in the right place. Before I carry on and tell you about future how, say, do you want to stop and just ask some questions about it? Or if you're happy to me for- Yes, no, absolutely. And, and um, uh, thank those that have already sent us uh, some questions within the Q&A function uh, below. There are, there are two questions I think that, that can be good for us to start on. And I'd like to thank Ben Fall and Sarah Shaw for sending it. Uh, one, as a result of, everything you just mentioned, right? We need to rethink uh, how we've lived as individuals, organizations, uh, even nations as a whole. So how can we use the various methodologies to rethink and change to a more sustainable uh, economy or what are new uh, paradigm shifts that need to happen on a system-wide level for us to not only, I'd say, uh, survive, but even thrive on this new reality that we'll be facing? Great question. I mean, you've just jumped straight into future how, because I tell you what started happening for me is that companies were kept asking me for these new solutions. And I kept wanting to go back and say, look, the economic system that we have built our business, our world, our whole economic system on comes from the 19th century from the industrial revolution where the priority was production, efficiency, and profitability. And so initially when this came about, we were in factories. But now what's happened is we're not in factories anymore, but we still expected to act like robots inside factories. So people are working harder than ever before. They're continuously stressed. They're continuously pushing. Why? 
because the economic system that was devised 150 years ago is telling us that profit over everything, consumerism is king, and production and efficiency is everything we need to focus on. And guess what? It's called neoliberal economic system. It's pseudoscience. It's not physics. It's just stories and narratives that we have picked up on over years and years that have moved from whispers to that's just the way it's always been. And it's not always just the way it's been, because if you had to apply that same thinking, slavery would still be legal, because that's what they all said. That's just the way it's been. Or women would never be able to vote, because God forbid women vote. That was just a story, and it got changed. Then we had child labor camps. That was, had to be legislated out so that people stopped putting children inside the, the labor camps. And in South Africa, we had apartheid. That was legalized racism. So you understand that narrative stories that we tell ourselves as human beings, we adopt as fact over anything else. We don't often stop and ask ourselves, is this the right way to go about doing it? Is it okay for us to ruin the planet just so we can have more money? Is it okay for us to ruin people's lives, make them miss their families and run anxiousness so that we can just more make more money? So the whole economic system and the whole neoliberal economic system, we are now writing an in-depth book to try and bring about a new economic system, a new way to define success so that we're not just chasing brands, but actually looking at new ways to go about being more reciprocal to other human beings. And so we've written, and I'll, and I'll take you through them very quickly, there's five things as sort of five starting points that we wanted to talk about. The first one is capitalism shouldn't always just be about competition, but what about collaboration. You see, successful economies are not jungles, they're gardens. And what we need to do is bring about more modern regulations that are more fair and more just to our world. And if we don't, guess what will happen? another 2008 crisis, or we'll have even more climate issues because these two things were brought about because of us allowing this free market to happen and people making more and more laws for them to make more and more money on the top and leaving everybody else in a bit of trouble. The second thing we speak about there is that capitalism or the new capitalism that we want to introduce is really about inclusion, not exclusion. And what we should do is start regulations that promote reciprocity so that more people can have more money in the middle class and the middle class can buy more and have a virtuous cycle to grow the market even further. Also, we need to rewrite the rules around shareholders are king because what we need is society first and then shareholders. In other words, we need to move from stakeholders to shareholders. In other words, it's employees, communities, shareholders and consumers that need to be benefiting from a corporation's profits. And also, greed is not good. Being rapacious or being aggressively greedy doesn't make you a capitalist. It makes you a sociopath. And sociopaths are not good for business or society when we need cooperation at scale to uplift humanity as we have it right now. And ultimately, we need to choose a new system, a new system with new norms and new narratives that allow many people to step up and move into a calm civil society where we have high functioning democracies that people can all benefit from. And this book is just a conversation starter. I don't have all the answers. I've researched of the best economies around the world, even some points from communism and even some points from socialism and even some points from capitalism. Take the best of them and look at us trying to rewrite a new renaissance. Thank you, John. Now, uh Something that made me just think of uh, from what you were mentioning on, on what are some key values. Now, our values as, as organizations and individuals have changed since we got stuck here at home, uh, dealing with our kids, family, and, and the like, right? So even as we go out into this new unknown, there are a set of values, and I would like to get your opinion on that, that we should, that we should at least... I wouldn't say focus on, but lean towards. And I wanted to get your opinion on that. Well, look, I think it just depends on culture. It depends on the organization and it depends on all these things. But the values that I've just mentioned, the reciprocity, the prioritization of community, the prioritization of employees over shareholders, those very simple value systems will make us more community focused. In other words, we won't be so reliant on China to be our manufacturers because what we've done is we've prioritized price over planet. And so for me, 
One, can we prioritize employees more? Can we prioritize the planet more? Can we think about what we're doing based on building a more sustainable reality rather than one that's short-lived based on quarterly profits? And so for me, it's about being more heart-led than more logical. It's about being more kind and nurturing than just being driven by profit. And so it's this rise of what you want to call, and some people are calling it, the feminine consciousness. It's this new way that we're starting to see organizations become more um, uh, sharing economy focused than hierarchical focused. And we are starting to see certain markets around the world really start to practice this well. So again, this is just a conversation starter. I've seen some questions come through is how do you start something like this? This is just a conversation starter. Remember, the UN came out of World War II. There was no UN before that. And the United Nations has done some incredible things. Remember also, the Spanish flu put women into leadership roles because the men were just, there were no men around. They'd all died. So again, when that first started happening, there was people going, are you mad? Women can't do this or black people can't do that or whatever the case was. And now it's become the norm. So again, what I am explaining here is often seen as very radical and how can you even speak about that? But what we have to do is realize that we just have to open a conversation about it and start to prioritize different values. Another question that, that we received here that touches upon, you, you just mentioned it, right? In terms of going through uh, an epidemic like that we're living through now shows us a lot of the flaws, right? How various countries act, how various even individuals act. And as a result, we've seen many of these flaws, but what can, and, and throughout history, you know, we, we hear that history repeats itself as a result. So based on, this, how can we, we as individuals or even as, as a global collective become more resilient? Okay, great question. And so I've written about this extensively and it's become more apparent and more important in today's world than ever before. As human beings, our perspective, our projections and our expectations are built on two things, stories and memories. And so what we have to do is realize that these stories that have been handed down to us, and just because we've been listening to them from when we were zero years old up to now, does not guarantee that they are the truth. They could have been the truth a long time ago. Doesn't mean they're the truth for where we're going. And so that's the first thing, is can we become critical, objectively, intelligently critical about certain stories that we are just following blindly? The second thing is this is that our memories that make up our projections and our expectations also need to be critically broken down. Because if you have had a very hard time, let's say with men, when you were bullied at school, and you go out throughout school, I mean, throughout your life, expecting men to bully you, whether you're a guy or a girl. And so what happens is that memory that you had when you were a kid predetermines what you look for and what you find in the world. And so our memories today have to become critically checked. And now science has proven that 50% of our memories are actually false. And I even think that most of our memories are false because think about it, what is a memory? It's a subjective story that you've held on to to bring about your identity. And so what we have to do is not worry about which one is false or not. What I've done in my personal life is I've tried to check which memories make me feel better which memories make me feel energized? Which memories want me to look for more optimism? And I keep those. But which memories on the other side are making me resentful, angry, upset, suspicious, and pessimistic? And then try and get down and fix those memories because you can change your memories. Anybody that you feel has hurt you or any situation that's hurt you, you can also become objective about that situation. You can realize that you yourself have become the bad person in other people's memories. And you're not a bad person, but you just had a bad day or a bad situation. So ultimately, what I'm saying is that the best thing we could do to move into the future, to move into the future optimistically, we need to become critical about the stories that have been handed down to us and critical about healing our memories so we can create new expectations and new projections. I wanted to go back to uh, your book, Future How. And I'm sure you, 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 you might have, as you just mentioned, it's just a conversational starter, but you may have uh, discussed some case studies of various organizations or various countries that have 
uh, elements of the future how uh, yes. ethos, got, so to speak. Yeah. So I just want you to, to, if it's okay to mention that. Look, before I even tell you about that, these are very cultural, complex situations. It's not one size fits all at all in any way. And that's why I co-authored with a world-renowned economist because I am not an economist. And so when I started diving deeper into the subject, I started to get anxious because I started to realize I'm not an economist, so I needed somebody to come with me. So we found a couple of stories. One, if you go to Denmark or any of those Scandinavian countries, their tax bill is in the 60, 70%. And they live in a world where most things are taken care of in the most futuristic way of thinking. But that culture also is very mature. That culture comes from a creator energy rather than a victim energy. And you can see certain countries suffer culturally from victim nuances. And so the economic systems there can't be the same as they are in Sweden and in Denmark. So if you look at any policies that are really working, look at the Scandinavian countries as one example. Another example we saw is that in the 90s, Seattle in America, lobbied their government or their national, their uh, regional government to increase the minimum wage from $7.25 to $15 per person. This had an incredible boom into that society and that economy. And what happened was restaurant workers were now able to afford to eat in the same restaurants as they were working. And if you think about it, many waiters can't afford to work, to pay and eat in the restaurants that they work in right now. Now, that's had some positive and it's had some negative because increasing wages doesn't always work. It has to be done on a pro rata basis per system. Another example that we looked at was Ford Motor Company. Back in the turn of the 19th century, they took their bill, their daily wage from $1.75 to $5 a day. And people said to Ford, Henry Ford, he said, are you mad? What are you doing? He says, well, if I'm making a vehicle for the people and the people working in my factory can't buy my car, what's the point? And so there are examples. But look, these are narratives and these are new research papers that are coming out some of the top universities in the world. Even Ray Dalio and Professor Galloway and um, Warren Buffett. And there are so many people that are now starting to come up with new ways that this economic system needs to move forward. So has there been some incredible success stories? No, because the stories are only starting to come out over the last five years or so. And we're waking up to the fact that there must be a new way as we start seeing the growth of this gap between the wealthy and the poor. And look, the last time this happened, the French Revolution happened. You know, they, it, people had enough of it. And so the pitchforks will come eventually. And also remember, the richer you get, the more money you suck out the system, the more oxygen you put out the system, who's gonna buy from you eventually when there's no money in the system? And so we have to think about this on a big paradigm shift. And that's why I've written this book as a guidebook. And then the next book will dive deeper into the hows that we can go about doing this. You mentioned the Henry Ford example. And, and this touches on a question that we received on social media, which was how can organizations with this new reality manage their human capital going forward? Right, we've seen uh, uh, organizations react, but moving forward, how should they be able to manage that talent? So look, the businesses that are gonna come out of COVID-19 the best are the ones that are decentralized. In other words, they're the ones who don't have hierarchical structures, high, high costs to keep their machine going, the ones that are flexible, adaptable, and are able to network into people and out of people per project as they start moving forward. There are some of these incredible businesses that have built themselves up to 4,000 employees that never have met in an office. They're just doing everything remotely. And these are the businesses that are going to come out of this COVID situation more successfully than the ones that are stuck in legacy costs. And so I've written about this as well quite extensively. And I've said that I think the future of work isn't going to be dependent on being employed and employee. It's much more about a networked effect. It's about what skills do you have that are unique to you? 
that you are only able to do based on your curiosity and your skill set. And you'll find a tribe of people around the world through the internet that want to pay for that service. And so we have to remember that the industrial revolution that we come from required us to play roles within the production line. Now, initially, those roles were people just hammering things and putting things together to create the production line. But the production line became more sophisticated. And we started to play the roles of lawyer, doctor, accountant, and engineer. And so what we did was, and our parents and many cultures around the world want their kids to be a great engineer, a great accountant, a great doctor. And this was incredibly valid in that world. Because now what's happened is we live in a surplus society, a surplus of incredibly smart people who are all educated in similar universities, studying similar things, working in similar organizations, bringing about similar products. And so the world we move into requires uniqueness. It inquires curiosity and authenticity. And in this new world where you are interconnected in a networked way, you then get celebrated much more when you're unique rather than being clever like the other 10,000 people that were clever. So ultimately what we need to do is keep our qualifications. There's nothing wrong with them. But then ask yourself a deeper question. What makes me most excited? What shines brightest for me? What am I curious about? And how can I combine my qualification with my curiosity, combine them and then go into the marketplace and watch the market celebrate you? And the best example I can give you, Said, and all the listeners is me, because I am highly fascinated with the future and human psychology and neuroscience and business strategy. Do you know who else is interested in those four things like I am? Nobody. That's the point. The point is my combination is so unique to me that I'm now get invited to sit with you guys and talk to you guys all because I have been incredibly fascinated and to research these topics deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And so my urge to you is to not think about employment and employee and culture and all those value systems like they used to be. Try and focus on where we're going. And in that place, realize the celebration of your uniqueness becomes the most important thing. You mentioned previously with, with now as people are trying to adapt to this new reality that they're in, uh, they go through the five stages of grief. And the hardest one is obviously going from anger to acceptance, right? And then pivoting to, all right, this is my new reality. I need to innovate. I need to run or I stagnate, right? So this is quite challenging <laughs> for, uh, for someone to move from here to there. Yeah. So what are, what are some, I would say, some of your insights on, on how yeah. can, can people proceed to that? Dad, how's your anger going, bro? Uh, Just kidding. Uh, Just kidding. No, no <laughs> comment. No comment. <laughs> I'm going to punch you next time I see you. No, I'm kidding. So look, here's the thing, is that this coronavirus has magnified anything that was under the current. If you were anxious, you have even more reason to be anxious now. If you were angry, there's even more reason to be angry now. And if you were sick, you could possibly die because of this coronavirus. So you understand that any underlying thing has now been shone to the front. Also, if your business was on the teetering of not doing well, guess what? It's history. And so what this COVID-19 has done is given us this opportunity to deal with underlying trauma. Now, here's the thing about trauma is that all of us have trauma. It's not exclusive to anybody. Everybody's got trauma from childhood, from high school, from relationships, whatever. We don't deal with trauma immediately as it happens. What happens to us is when we are in a safe environment or when we have a lot of time on our hands, this trauma starts to bubble to the top. And all of a sudden you rage with anger and you don't even know why. Or you're so depressed that you can't get out of bed and you don't know why. And ultimately what we have to do, and there's no silver bullet aid, and that's the real key here, is that we have to systematically dive into our psychology, into our memories, and heal them. Because ultimately if we don't, that anger will be with you for life. And then you'll justify your anger, that's just, that's who I am. And that's not who you are. That's who you've decided to be, because you didn't want to heal that memory from your past. And so I personally have come from a single mom family, and my father left us when we were very young. And so for the longest time, I was resentful to my, aunt, my father. I was resentful for the fact that he didn't look after us. He was violent with us. It was just a terrible place to grow up. But then I reached 40 years old. And I realized that he was just a guy who never had an opportunity to deal with what his father did to him. 
And so he was emotionally not given the opportunity to heal. And so all he could do was do what he did and what he felt. And so the minute I could release him of that and release him of that expectation of perfection, I was so calm and so energized and I could move easily from anger to acceptance. Because ultimately the anger might not be from your situation now, it could be from something in the past. So those five stages of mourning bring up not only what's going on now, but things from the past. And if you're finding yourself raging or anxious or even more, remember it might not just be from now. It might be from things that happened to you many, many years ago. Thanks, John. Um, so we, we, we're getting a lot of questions in terms of se that are sector focused, so to speak, right? In terms of, so for example, Maher uh, sent that, uh, you know, post 9-11, there was a lot of focus on counterterrorism. And as a result, the funding has spiked. There's a lot of development that happened in that regard. With now with COVID-19, are we going to see, in particular, I'm sure there will be a spike in, in virology and in, 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 in fighting epidemics. But in your opinion, what are new sectors that we will see more interest in, uh, in terms of, from a public perspective and even from a funding perspective? Look, if I just talk about, let's just talk about education, for example. Education is going to change fundamentally. If you are in education, remote education, remote VR education, in goggles and virtual reality in education, you are on a good wicket. If you can see what's happened with Microsoft and the shares and all the tools that they have, all those tools are allowing us to have remote work. Other sectors that I think will absolutely grow is the... Um, checking of our health, the, 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 the nanotechnology that will start looking at us and checking our under our skin health. Because what I think is going to happen is just like we know when a tsunami is coming or when a um, global earthquake is coming, because we have systems in place and um, sort of sensors in place to check that, those same sensors are now going to be within us. And so what we will start doing is not having giving away our health information so that we don't have another pandemic like this. Because if we can, if we had been able to check the Wuhan thing on the 31st of December when it started, we would have never had any of this. So when it comes to health, I think there's going to be a huge spike. When I think when it comes to remote education, I think there's going to be a huge spike. I think also ghost kitchens are going to huge, become huge. And ghost kitchens are this concept where you get a warehouse um, with six different chefs in it, that one's cooking Israeli food, one's cooking Arab food, one's cooking Chinese food, one's cooking French food. And what you do is you have a very low cost base and then you have delivery do and, and uh, Uber Eats and all these people delivering the food for you on your behalf. So I think also the, the sphere of socializing too much is also going to be impacted on the way we socialize with each other. And so I see the rise of ghost kitchens happening as well. So I also see the demise of many of the social structures we had around shopping centers because we're just fearful. Now. And until we have those tests in place and until we have those sensors in place and until we have the vaccines in place, all the businesses that were all about congregation of human beings are going to be slowly changing. And so any of those sort of sectors, I think will be changing dramatically. Thank you. Um, one question that, that I have is based on what, you've seen and uh, the research that you've done, how did the knowledge accumulation as we're, you know, in this reality stuck at home, the knowledge generation, content generation for new content. And as you were writing, not just one, but three books uh, at one time, in your opinion, with this change, how can humanity generate more knowledge while they're not being able to go to, libraries and not being able to meet with people as they would usually do? Look, um, this is not something that's going to last forever. And it's really just something that we have been put into our own isolation, not only physically, but in our own emotional, mental place as well. We've been put inside. So it's almost like this long-term meditation retreat that we've all checked into. And now we have to deal with the noise inside our heads. What I have done, and that's all I can really tell you about, is what I've realized and what I've seen is that knowledge is the accumulation of other people's wisdom. And the way you combine old age wisdom in new ways is the new wisdom. 
And if you think about it, that anything that you've learned or seen is based on that person learning from somebody else, connecting those invisible dots to be able to give you some sort of theory. And so if you look at maybe, for example, Chef's Table, say, have you ever watched Chef's Table on Netflix? It's an incredible um, uh, series. And so what they do in Chef's Table, if you haven't watched it, it's one of my best series I've ever watched. But what they do is they track the top 50 chefs in the world. And those top 50 chefs in the world have similar stories. They go and they work inside a French restaurant for 15 years. They kill themselves. They work so hard. Then they go back home and they want to copy something that the chef they learn from to do in a restaurant. That restaurant fails. They get divorced. They get cancer. A whole bunch of different things happen to them. And then they wake up out of that and they become unique in their approach by combining all their learnings, the range of experience that they've had into their unique factor. They become the top 50 chef in the world. Why? Because it's a combination of multiple layers of knowledge that brings about that genius. So I think by us being stuck in the, in the house, it's given me an opportunity to move away from the extensive traveling I used to do, the extensive moving to conferences or strategy sessions, and just giving me the space to just research my highest curiosity, my highest excitement. And that combination is unique to me and brings about three books which even surprises me because I failed English at school. So even me, I'm surprised at the fact that I can write so much. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's quite a surprise that you, uh, that you failed English and now you, that you're able to not only, not only express yourself, but you be, be able to even provide such, uh, such wisdom and insight. Thank you. But you understand that school was made for a certain type of personality. Yeah. School yeah. was about how quickly can you obey rules and are you good in maths, English, science, and uh, engineering, whatever the, those others were? STEM, right? I'm terrible at those. But school never gave me an opportunity to shine with my other personalities, you know? So I've, after school, I started shining. But during school, man, I was terrible at school. <laughs> and I think that's the case for, for many people, including myself. Oh, uh, cool. We have a question from uh, Jumana, and I, th I think that's a, quite an interesting question. Um, Inside that now many uh, uh, organizations and people are looking into in terms of how will consumer trends and needs during and post, uh, uh, post COVID-19 uh, will be looked at, right? We, we're already seeing the massive impact on logistics in the logistics sector and manufacturing. Uh, so I just want to get your, your insights on that. Great, great question. Um, I was speaking to a CEO of an organization in Germany the other day, and he was saying to me that the driving of the concept of moving away from consumer centricity to planet centricity has just been turbocharged. And so first and foremost, I think the concept of planet centricity is going to be on top of mind for everybody, because we've realized now that if we don't respect the environment and nature, look what's happened to us. We've become the animals inside the zoo and the animals on the outside are looking at us thinking, what the hell is going on with these people? They're all stuck inside the zoo like they used to force us into. And so what this COVID-19 really is, if you think about it, is that we've destroyed so many ecosystems that the virus that used to comfortably live inside a bat and never kill a bat has now jumped into us because that ecosystem has been ruined. And so we realize that to be respectful and elegant and conscious to the environment is by far the most important thing we could do as consumers. So if we come to consumer needs, there are a few of them that I've been advising organizations on. The first one is hyper-personalization. What we need to realize is our consumers are expecting more and more and more from us, and they require a more sophisticated service. Think about Netflix. Netflix has got so much choice that we spend 30 minutes trying to choose what to watch before we even watch anything. By the time we watch something, we're so bored, we leave. Which means that that choice is not what we're after. We are after personalization. So that's the first one. The second one is seamlessness. We want things done easily, quickly, preempt, before we even think we want it, we want it delivered. And so Amazon is great at this. They, in certain test pockets, have got so much data on so many people that once a month they're sending you a box with the things they think you want. And you know, they send you another box that's empty and whatever you don't want from that full box, you put into the empty box and send back. In some of the cases, they have a 72% success rate. Why? Because they've learned our behavior so well that that's what's happened. And third, hyper trust. We want to trust people that we buy from. We want to trust organizations 
that we want to support. And I urge people to become consumer activists. If you find an organization that's not prioritizing their employees or hurting the planet or hurting anything that you prioritize, don't buy from them. Build this concept of being a consumer activist. And so ultimately we realize this, is that there are new business models that are being formed. And we have to become very key on these business models and move away the concept of supply and demand. Supply and demand is an ancient business model. And so we realize that the supply and demand model doesn't bring about success. Gillette, that last year lost $8 billion, they were an incredibly efficient supply and demand business. But at the same time, another business called the $1 Shave Club got sold for a billion dollars because they had the new business model. So the business model that I'm tracking that I think is by far the most powerful one is called curate, match, and facilitate. So how do we curate what our customers want? How do we match it to them personally? And how do we facilitate to them for as easy as possible? And the best example I can give you is Spotify. If you, are you on Spotify, Saeed? Yeah. No? So if you yeah. think about Spotify, how amazing is Spotify? How has it changed your relationship to music? You listen to more music more often by new artists than ever before for how much? You don't even know how much it is. You know why? Because it's so cheap. $5, I mean, it's nothing. I mean, I don't even know what it is myself. But if you think about buying food, clothes, going on a date, going on a holiday, the way Spotify does it, wouldn't you be there? You'd be there to flash. Why? Because you don't even have to think. So utilizing the curate, match and facilitate business model, that's going to be applicable to every industry, no matter what you sell it. John, we've been mentioning all of the things that have changed or will be changing uh, post-COVID. In your opinion, and thank you, Latifa, for sending the question, what will not change? Yes, great, great. You know, I get that question every time. So <laughs> what won't change is human nature. Our need to be seen, our need to be touched, our need to socialize, our need to be heard, that human nature is never going to end. Right after World War II, human nature didn't end. After the Spanish flu, human nature didn't end. So I think the constructs of our need to be heard, to be seen, to be touched, to be felt, to socialize, those won't end. The way we'll do it will change and shift according to us managing the pandemic. But ultimately, we have become more sophisticated animals. We are more sophisticated in our societies, and we require more sophisticated solutions to our need as human beings to be heard, heard, felt, seen, and socialized. One thing that I've, I was thinking throughout, throughout the past 45 minutes now, in your opinion, and what, from what you've seen, what has been the most profound um, thing that you've seen uh, throughout this, this challenging time? You know, great question. Um, the first, when it first started happening, I found myself crying deeply, watching Italian families speaking about their grandparents passing without them being next to them. Watching Spanish doctors talk about what was going on in the Spanish hospitals. That really affected me deeply without me even being surprised by it. But then what started catching me on an emotional level was violinists standing on the top of buildings playing for the hospitals in Italy. When we found people clapping the taxi driver that was coming in into a Madrid hospital for giving free lifts to people that were sick into the hospital. And we started to see the celebration of new heroes. And so I think the construct of us seeing this hyper collaboration where human beings all have one enemy and for us to come together and where we see divisive policies of politics quietening down. People don't have time for that when we are all fighting one enemy. And so we have, a, apparently, the last I read was 100 million pharmacists, scientists, doctors, and people in biology labs looking for a cure. Have you ever seen 100 billion people, million people looking for one solution? No. And so we see, and for me, the most fascinating, heartwarming thing that's come out of this is the level of humanity, that we have all come together and we are all seeing this as, as we are in it together. No matter how much money you have, or no matter how beautiful you are, or no matter if you're white or black or green or pink, coronavirus can catch you. So now all of a sudden, it's a level playing field. And so we even see hyper collaboration coming with Google and Apple joining forces to help with checking up on people's health. 
So for me, the most fund fundamental thing that's happened is the humanness that's arrived from this and the lack of divisive policies and politics that have just taken by the side because nobody has time for that drama when we're in this human sort of um, situation. John, we received a question from Ibrahim from Germany and, and I like how he put it. So obviously you've mentioned remote working and how that's gonna change uh, uh, corporate culture and how, even culture in general, right? So based on, on the demand for mobility will, will, will reduce dramatically, how will that change our understanding of mobility, transport, and therefore understanding how we live in our cities? Very good question, I love it. I wanna tell you about the first autonomous vehicle ever. Say, do you know we're the first autonomous vehicle in the world? Do you have any guess? Any guess? Uh, no. The elevator. So what happened when the elevator arrived into our society is before the elevator arrived, the biggest buildings we used to have was three to six floors. Anything past that was just too much for us to want to climb. And the buildings that were three to six floors before the elevator arrived, the poorest people lived on the top and the richest people lived at the bottom because that's the way it was. Nobody wanted to walk up six floors or three floors or whatever it was. And in fact, if you remember, the top floor was like an attic. It was this little crummy little thing at the top and nobody really wanted to live in there unless you were poor. And then the elevator arrived. And then all of a sudden, what happened? The top floor is the most expensive floor. It now sees the whole view and the poorest people live at the bottom. And so I think what's starting to happen now is the advent of new property prices in places away from the cities, away from the metropolises and nearer to nature. So what's going to happen for me is that it's not only mobility that's going to change, the prices of housing are going to change. Because why would you want to live on top of each other in a shoebox in New York somewhere where you don't have to go to work anymore. What you can do is live out in the country and you can go hiking in the mornings with your dog and then you can maybe catch an autonomous vehicle into the city once a week to meet with somebody and otherwise you want Zoom and speaking to everybody out there. So mobility obviously is changing and as we're seeing right now is changing. Prices of property, absolutely. But even more is which cities and which sub-cities and which third-rate cities are going to become first-rate cities? Because what they'll need to do, and is what we're starting to see right now as humans, what do we love? We want to be close to airports. So if we want to travel anywhere, we've got that. We want good coffee. We want good socializing and good restaurants. And we want nature for our families and ourselves. So that means that the construct of a city also changes and where we want to live will start to change because of what's happening. Thank you, John. Um, as we're, we're nearing... Um our time. I just want to give you some time if you want to uh, mention any last thoughts, uh, any, any points you want to bring up. Look, ultimately, we are in the biggest gift. Look, I don't want to take anything away from people who've lost anybody because I myself have said many prayers for them and I myself have felt that pain. I have self, my friends who have got COVID and in fact, one of my friend's father passed away from COVID. So I don't wanna take anything away from the pain and destruction it's causing. But remember, if you are fortunate to be safe, to be healthy, to have money, to have a roof over your head and food on your plate, don't waste this gift. This is a gift that's come to us to give us an opportunity to breathe, to pause, to become objective, to heal, to think about new ways we can become leaders in the new world. Think about the renaissance that's gonna be coming. How can you play an active part in it? How can you access your genius and your creativity and your curiosity to come out of this better than you went in? Because if you don't, you're gonna come out of it waiting for the things to go back to normal and they're not gonna happen. And you're gonna even be sadder. So please take this opportunity to access your genius and bring about more impact into the world in the new way. Thank you very much, John. We have our, uh, the, our CEO, Khalfan Bilhol, CEO of Dubai Future Foundation, and the world's first uh, Minister of Artificial Intelligence uh, of the UAE, Omar uh, al Ulama. And I want to I wanna, uh, uh, just leave the floor for any final comments, gentlemen, if you have yeah. any, uh, anything that you'd like to share. Muhammad Fadal. Uh, thank you, John, and thank you, Saeed. Um, it was... Uh, 
fabulous being part of the session. Honestly, I needed a dose of um, uh, mental coffee, and that's what you gave us, I think, in the session. Uh, fasting all day, you know, we needed this uh, stimulation of excitement, of inspiration. Thank you very much for that. Um, I must say it was a mix of both philosophical discussions as well as really practical uh, insights that, that we're going to use. Uh, I wanted to ask about, um, you know, the, the other, other side of things. So how do you think COVID is going to change governments? And um, where can we as governments be proactive? Because I don't think we can afford to be reactive beyond uh, COVID, right, with all the things that we can expect. So if you could please just give us your insights on that. And thanks a lot for the great session. I want to say a couple of things. One, I watched you speak at Abu Dhabi Digital Conference, uh, Digital Next Conference, and you yeah. in, awakened me to the concept of how the Islamic world stopped and wasn't allowed to use the printing press. You said that story, and it just blew my mind. So thank you so much for that, because you told me so much this. What's it's the mutual, second? then. Yeah, thank you. But secondly, how am I going to tell you and your government how to prepare when you're already leaps ahead of any other government out there. I mean, no other government has a minister of artificial intelligence or any of those things. So firstly, I want to say, look, I'm a, I've chosen for Dubai to be my city of residence because I just love everything you guys are doing. So that's, thank you. But ultimately, I think it's not just COVID-19 that was changing governance. It was technology. It was more sophisticated consumers. It was IoT. It was blockchain. It was artificial intelligence. And it's the merging of our sophisticated needs together with technology fast tracking with the advent of 5G coming that will automatically change what role government needs to play with its citizens. And so I think COVID-19, the only thing it's done for me, it's brought 2030 to 2020. And I'm sure you'll agree that we were expecting the remote work to come soon that we will be thinking about these sort of things in the next five or seven years, all of a sudden they're here. And so I think all that's happened is that the future has arrived sooner than we ever thought it would. And I think that's the thing that is. But as far as UAE is concerned, you know, out of every city in the world, I've chosen to live in Dubai, and that's got to say itself, I'm a big fan. So there's not much I can say. Thanks a lot, John. John, thank you very much. I mean, uh, please, uh, first of all, uh, Allow me to thank you, first of all, for uh, such an energetic session. And I thank you, I thank Saeed for, uh, and the team for arranging this. I mean, as His Excellency Umar mentioned, uh, this is the last part of our fasting practice where we're usually uh, so hungry and thirsty and so drained out. But uh, honestly, no joke, I mean, you've given us energy with your, with your energy and talks. So, and so uh, thank, you. thank you for that, and we really appreciate it. And you've, you've mentioned the word, um, uh, turbocharged a few times and and this is honestly what has happened in this period, uh, this period of time yes. where everything like you mentioned has gotten uh, accelerated whether it's work from home or education but what I loved is is towards the end I was saving uh, uh, I was going to say it that this in my opinion was the the most thing that uh, uh, is a turbocharge or a wake-up call for us which is um, uh, a wake-up call for humanity. And you mentioned it exactly at 5.48, and I was like, oh, you mentioned it. I was going to say this towards the end. But honestly, um, for me, this is what really uh, has turbocharged in this period of time. It's the uh, appreciation of humanity. It's the inclusiveness. It's us working together when such a global challenge needs us all to be unified. Had we had that unity at a global level, as you perfectly mentioned, things like this, would have been solved in a much better way. But unfortunately, we don't have that. And I think what we're going through at the moment is a definite um, wake-up call. So from my end, John, uh, there's no question. And I know we're running out of time. I just want to thank you so much for, for an amazing kickoff for the Ramadan Pioneer Series. And uh, hopefully, we can see more of you and more of your energy soon, inshallah. And thank you to Saeed and to everyone else that had joined us for the kickoff today. Thank you so much. I cannot wait for this to be over so I can go move back to the city of choice. So as soon as it's over, I'll be straight back and come say hi to you. Thank you Excellent. so much. Excellent. Looking forward. All right. And, and on that, you. everyone who attended, thank you very much. And we apologize. We couldn't get through the uh, questions that everyone sent. We had over 230 people attend at one point. John, thank you so much. Khalfan, uh, Your Excellency, thank you very much for attending. Uh,
and hopefully for those who are uh, fasting, iftar and haniyan and qabla. And uh, thank you everyone and see you at our next Pioneer Series session. Ciao. Bye-bye.